Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been an adventure trying getting this panel together, but I think you'll all be entertained and educated. Um, we've got a great um, lead speaker, keynote speaker, coming in, but Kevin O'Sullivan, who's a legend all his own, is going to come up and tell you a little bit about him, and I'll let Kevin say a little bit about himself at the same time. Great. Um, you're in for a treat. I, I'll just say that. Um, I run uh, FBI, Mass Biomedical Initiatives, here in the city. Some of you may know of us. Some of you have uh, incubated with us. Uh, we're focused primarily on life and health science companies, uh, highly sophisticated BL2 laboratories. So the Innovation Center or Running Star really complements what we do in terms of robotics or office space or whatever, because I always say we're not in the office business. We're in the straight lab business. Um, obviously, as Joe hit the nail on the head. Our job is to try to get people out on their own. And uh, quite frankly, we've been very successful uh, over the years because uh, of the companies. We're all about our companies. We have 35 laboratories in four uh, different facilities throughout the, throughout the city. Um, and obviously, brains and innovation are, are in abundance across the state. So at the end of the day, it's about moving them on out and uh, being successful in uh, not only creating a company, but more importantly, building the economy with jobs and everything else that comes with it. So tonight, you have um, one of our all-stars and a great friend of mine. And I'll just tell you just a little history because uh, uh, he doesn't say much about himself. But uh, I got a call just quickly uh, back in 2002 when we were just moving forward uh, for Paul. Uh, and he was working at Pfizer uh, down in Cambridge uh, on the river. And I went down, had lunch with him, and it was really funny. He had an idea about protein synthesis and had a great job as a, you know, as a, as a scientist. He uh, was getting his master's at, uh, in business, MBA at BU. Um, and he had this fascination, you know, when you run into entrepreneurs. And one of, the, one of the things I love about my job is I hang out with people who are so smart. And they're smarter than I am. But, you know, they have this vision of where they want to go. And, and Paul had that vision. When you've been at it for a while and you sit there and you listen to someone, you get just exudes. And uh, Paul had a great vision, but he needed a place to go. Uh, and I remember him saying that he was ahead of the curve on contract manufacturing and research. And in essence, back then, all the biotech companies and all of the pharma companies were all kind of doing it all in-house. Well, he stepped out ahead of everybody and said, they'll come out if we provide the quality and the cost and the service and the locale. So I remember saying to him, well, what's the chance of Pfizer giving you some business? And he looked at me. I'll never forget it, Paul. And you said, you didn't say 75. And he said, like, like a scientist, oh, oh, 70%. I said, well, what the hell are you doing sitting here? Let's do it. So Paul came and was one of our first tenants uh, at the old St. Vincent Hospital. Um, and I watched him over the first couple of years with his partner. And those were rough times, up and down. And I remember I was pretty kind of sensitive, at the end of the day, you always got a chance to talk to the entrepreneurs if they had a good day or a bad day. And with Paul, you know, I, I admired the fact that he's always stayed up, or he went down, and, but whatever it was, he always kept that vision out in front of him. Well, the long story short, um, he's now on the board, he has sold off part of his uh, share. Uh, equity uh, group came in, took it over. Uh, we built out beautiful space for them, uh, over where Paul is, over in uh, upstairs in 50 Prescott at Gateway, state-of-the-art, better than Pfizer space. Pfizer comes in and goes, wow, this is incredible. They have 150 customers, uh, 45 to 50 employees. Paul is the founder um, and uh, basically still sits on the board. And of course, we're reinventing the strategy and reinventing the company. Here's a guy that started it when it was, you know, an idea. Took it to where it is and let it go as an entrepreneur and did what Joe talked about moved it over. So anyway, it's a successful company, and we're very proud of uh, him, Paul, and uh, his company, and he'll tell you a little bit about it tonight. Fascinating story, and please hold your questions, because I think it'll be a good discussion, and then he'll sit on the panel, too. Please welcome Paul Wengender. You know, almost every time um, I get a chance to speak, it's a, a, at night in Worcester. I have to follow this guy. So um, it's a tough act to follow. Um, but, you, you know, I would reciprocate uh, my thoughts 
for MBI. And if you're thinking about innovation centers and incubators, when I talk to folks, even at Lab Central and down in Cambridge, I said, you know what? Um, sometimes you're a stabilizing force and sometimes you're an inspiring force, but you have to be a force. Uh, because most of the people that start companies, they're scientists. They're not a guy um, at Ernst & Young who are, who are analyzing the life science industry. They're in it. These guys are in it. They're, or they're in um, academics. And they've beat to death their scientific hypothesis. What they think they could do what, what, what sort of product or service or technology platform they could bring to the market. And most of the time, and, and now as a consultant, almost all the time, either there isn't a concrete plan, a real business plan around these ideas, scientific hypothesis, if you will, but there really isn't a business hypothesis. And um, what, you, what incubators can do is, is sometimes shine a light uh, on the way they can get to a bench, they can get to an office, they can make some connections. They can get up in front of people. They, they can rub elbows with other people who share the same sort of you know, joy and pain that, that is um, part of being an entrepreneur. And um, I have to say that MBI, for me, you know, I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I started one company. I, was, I worked at Pfizer and AstraZeneca before that. Um, but to have so not only a consoling force, but a motivational force, um, and, and look, it's Kevin O'Sullivan, he's always positive, you know? <laughs> um, you know, we, we could lose contracts with big companies, um, and this guy would be like, hey, hey, don't worry about it, there's, there's 10 more companies out there, and you know what? Damn it, he, he's right. So you just gotta stay positive. And I thought maybe since, uh, you know, Mike Deneranu, who I know, um, he, he's a Sturbridge guy as well as I am, um, I know some of the ways he thinks about um, reinventing the company, uh, the way he thinks about um, sort of technology and people that he hires. Um, and and I, I won't speak for him, but, I, but when I thought about being on the panel originally, um, I, I did think about, okay, you know, I'll say a little bit about Blue Sky um, in the context of who we are. It's probably gonna be a little bit different than the other panelists. Um, but maybe as you start to get beyond talking about your individual company, some themes uh, start to develop. And so, a little bit about Blue Sky, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, where tech companies probably need to be, and some of the lessons we learned in that, in that um, sort of growth curve that Kevin talked about, especially the first two or three years. Uh, we were just figuring it out sometimes, you have to be adaptable. And uh, you know, the third part is really, um, and I said this to Christine before we, before we, we, we uh, came out here, and I was talking about um, the question and answer session, and I, you know, whatever the question is, the answer is almost always people. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the guiding um, the company forward with the right cultural principles. Um, so a little bit about Blue Sky. Uh, yeah, uh, I was running um, an internal gene to screen uh, core lab at Pfizer, uh, both down at Groton and up in uh, Memorial Drive in Cambridge. And um, Pfizer was going through its own uh, number of challenges, which are well documented, you, you know, patent cliffs, et cetera, and looking at ways strategically they can move and be lean, uh, but still focus on their core competencies. And one area, unfortunately for me, was that gene to screen space. I mean, we're talking about the first zero to two years of a 16 year idea to drug pipeline. Um, and in that zero to two year space, you know, we'll, we'll clone a gene, make a protein, make a cell line. That's a tool for structural biology, HTS, high throughput screening, or uh, biological. All right, so uh, the director at uh, Pfizer comes down to me, um, and one day says, well, you're doing a great job. This is, this is, you know, things are going really well. Your team totally delivers, but you can't hire anybody. You're not gonna grow your team. Um, what we are going to do is we're going to give you a wheelbarrow full of money and you're going to go out and find vendors. All right? and so it was at that point where I said, well, Pfizer is doing this. They're looking outside. I was getting my MBA in entrepreneurship at BU. So I'm going to write a business plan around actually doing this for Pfizer, Merck, Novartis, um, Sanofi, Aventis. They've all changed names since 2002. <laughs> so I used the up-to-date names. Um, and, and sure enough, we had some first customers. We launched into MBI out here in Worcester. Started with two people, 
And um, you know, we grew to 45 in 10 years, and um, we hit all the exit points that we needed to hit uh, for the early investors and for the, for the founders as well. Uh, so, so it was, uh, by those measurements, a success. And one of the underpinnings of the success was, so we're building a service enterprise. We, we have pharma-trained um, employees for the most part, as well as a lot of the great young minds around here at WPI and Clark and Holy Cross, hiring from lo local um, and, and getting them, uh, I don't want to say brainwashed, but um, just getting them to absorb and immerse themselves in the culture, a service culture around biotechnology. And so that's where I make a threat to other types of technology, whether it's fiber optics or, or, or some sort of computer support IT um, or biotech. Um, so I, I'm answering the question of, of how you uh, reinvent yourself with um, a, a fairly obvious point. And I, I apologize for that, but um, it, it's, in, it's in your culture. It's in how you think about starting your company. And for us, at a time when there were threats overseas for low-cost, run-rate business, commoditization of certain things, you know, making DNA has become a commodity, um, we, we knew that would come. We knew that would happen. Making antibodies to a certain degree has become a commodity. And maybe it wasn't 10, 12 years ago when we started, but we knew it would. And we needed to create a culture of innovation. And that's how you reinvent yourself. Um, so. We also, from the start, would talk about vendorship versus partnership. In today's day and age, and we are the last segment of the drug discovery pipeline really to convert to a CRO model for those large companies. And in this day and age, across the pipeline, from, from idea to drug, that 16 year, you've got a value chain, a cluster of uh, pipeline supply chain partners, not vendors, partners people who are bringing expertise along the pipeline. So when we started Blue Sky, we started, you know, pardon the pun, but our DNA had to be um, based on principles and as a partner, not a vendor. You know, we're not going to continue to do something for five or six years that's a conveyor belt, uh, you know, automated technology because we're hiring really smart, critically thinking people. Um, our intellectual assets are uh, levered in a way that we want to be problem solvers and solution providers, um, not just a turn crank machine, because that turn crank machine is not going to be around for long. It's going to go to China or India, and for, and for good reasons. You have to understand that the customer needs lean, high efficiency operations. So we need to keep a level of intellectual assets high, a high degree of critical thinking within our labs. And of course, we can build things that are first to market for that turn crank and, and capture margins with it. And, and really, that's the story. I think one of the big underlying stories for Blue Sky's success is that we adapted quickly to changing market demands in a way that um, we were able to uh, listen to the customer, but also we had agile thinking intellectual assets, our people, um, that could listen to the customer, bring it back, tailor it, or, or come up with a new, a new service that then we could, let's say if we did it for Novartis, um, and Novartis liked it, and we said, you know, no one else on the market is offering this type of service, this type of delivery. Um, let's bring it back, let's fine tune it, let's look at cost of goods sold, and, and how many, what our capacity utilization is around this, and then let's roll it out as a service, and let's be the first to market. And so we had a series of examples where we're able to do this. And the, the last part of, I believe, why, and it's also the hardest thing to recreate. You know, for years, Kmart tried to do Walmart, or uh, American Airlines tried to, do, uh, tried to battle Southwest. But it's the way those companies started that, that created a whole culture that made it almost impossible for those rivals to, to, to replicate. And, and so when we started, we had uh, core values or guide, guiding principles of a service company. And I believe that this, these sort of principles were the key reasons why, um, and when we didn't follow them, by the way, we, we had a terrible time. Um, and and we, we had these 
It kind of sounds corny, but we had five C's. We didn't have a mobile um, hanging from the hallway when people come in, but we had, we had these these five C's. And I actually, there's the one thing I wrote down before I came over. So the, the first three of the five C's were continual self improvement, constant team innovation, and the customer is the boss. And uh, they all play together, right? Continual self improvement. Uh, in 2009, we hired nine students um, that had just graduated in May, from around here mostly. Uh, probably half of them, well half, you know, okay, five or four, were from WPI. And um, with the idea that we had this backlog, we knew, we knew that Pfizer was going to increase their orders, Merck was going to increase their orders, and a few others. So we need to immerse them into our, into our culture, you know, stand alongside existing scientists and have not just the techniques, but also the philosophy of the company get absorbed. And we also would preach to them that if you're improving your skill sets at a certain rate, the sky is the limit, right? So each uh, bachelor's in um, biochemistry come in, listen, um, if you learn this technique, and we would send people off to school or, or short courses to learn it, you're not only improving yourself, but you may, you may be the steward of a new service. We have several examples of employees who, some of which are still at Blue Sky, who started out you know, 10 years ago um, as uh, technical scientists and are now directors because they just continued with that philosophy that they needed to be aggressive, um, proactive with their own careers. So be a little bit selfish about your own self-improvement, all right? Because odds are nobody cares as much as you do about your own growth. And so we try to instill that in everybody and demand that they get to learn new things, okay, spread out. And, and we know that we can always reinvent um, our service offerings around flexible, dynamic people who want to learn more. All right, that was one thing. So we, we always talk as companies about continual improvement. We kind of drilled it down and put the onus on each individual. And, and by the way, we had up until 2010, 85% of our company was in the lab. 15% business, accounting, finance, and, and other things. Um, so we were very focused on the engine of the company. That was our core. Um, so the, the other C, second C, constant team innovation. Well. Um, that goes without saying. Right? So, so this ties in actually in some ways with when we do talk to customers, we get out to talk to customers. Communication is one of the one of the other C's, one of the five. Communication and customer is the boss. Well, okay, those all work together. We bring we bring information back from the customer. The customer says. I am resource constrained here on um, bacterial artificial chromosomes, but there isn't a single vendor out there who makes bacterial artificial chromosomes. Um, is that something the you know the well of experience and and skill sets at Blue Sky that you you could do? And a salesperson would say, well, no, it's not in the catalog, but we're a partner, and so they'll they'll take that back and say to Norm, our CSO, Norm. They're asking for bacterial artificial chromosomes in the company's Takeda. They're big, and they probably need a lot of it. And, and, the, and so the culture at Blue Sky is like, all right, let's do it. Well, let's figure out, you know, let's just spec out the, the labor time and, and see if we can get into an evaluation phase. And um, the team needs to innovate around it. It's always, it's always more than one person, right? So there's, there's a concerted level of activity for, like, like just for that activity. There, there are three or four people in the process to create a bacterial artificial chromosome. And um, lo and behold, you know, it wasn't perfect the first time, but we kept listening to the customer, customer's boss. They're not always right, but they are the boss. We were, we were very careful about our language. Um, they, they, but when, when they're wrong, you have to, actually have to have a little more finesse than we have had sometimes, all right? Um, but, you know, we're not perfect. The, the, but the last component of it for me, the last C, is, um, is capacity utilization. And this one sounds like a business term of 50 years old, like a factory. But when you really look at your company and your service company, so remember, uh, we came at this from uh, resource allocation, return on labor, um, how are we getting the most out of our, our, our people? 
And in a service industry, especially ours, the demand curve ebbs and flows. We had to develop a model that fit all those other C's and the ability to be adaptable. So not just listening to the customer on what's new, but sending people out to shows. Look, we knew that um, in December we were going to be at 100% capacity utilization. We also knew that in August we might be at 50 or 60%. So there happened to be a lot of shows in us. Send people out to learn more, bring it back, and we used 10 to 15% of our retained earnings to fund internal R&D to come up with our own services, not just uh, relying on the, the, the market to pull new services in, um, listening to the customer, but also invent our own. And um, I can't tell you the number of times rivals, um, competition that also turned into co-opetition um, in, in an industry that Blue Sky was in and still is, uh, that our rivals would come over and say, how the hell did you guys find time to invent that or, or create that service? So it's just part of who we are. And um, it's also because when you do that, you can stay out front, capture greater margins, the life cycle of a service or a product, capture greater, greater margins um, in the beginning um, that um, eventually, if you're not changing, it gets cannibalized. We all know the life cycle. Um, but with those margins, then use, use it, funnel it back into an R&D pipeline. So Blue Sky was actually um, fairly successful. We made a lot of bad decisions, but um, in, in the spirit of being a partner and um, focusing on you know, continual self-improvement as well as team innovation, uh, we were able to stay ahead of the curve enough um, with, with the different services and platforms that we rolled out uh, to build a decent sized company out here in Worcester. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll take questions. You know, when I started talking about um, the community, the, the people around you, the mentors around you, sort of shining a light on your path, helping you see it. Um, I really needed it, honestly. I think I, I, think I, do, I did have the um, energy and the drive and the adaptability, the flexibility. You know, we re rewrote our business plan every 18 months, but I wouldn't have, never, I wouldn't have ever written the first one um, if it weren't, wasn't for my mentor, Pete Russo at uh, BU who was uh, the, he's head of the Entrepreneurial Management Institute there. And I actually had another um, uh, uh, advisor, and I switched to him after taking his class. I said, I've got to follow this guy. You know, um, and it really, you know, for a scientist by training, um, you know, eight, eight, nine years in labs, in, in, uh, from bachelor's, uh, graduate school, and, and then, you know, dropping into a, a lab at Pfizer and, and AstraZeneca, it was, it was still scary to, to look out uh, over the wall. And at the time, we had our first kid and all the other things you hear about. Um, but to have that, that steady, steady influence, and I think he was the first one to tell me, what's the worst thing that can happen when you start this company? And um, I said, well, you know, we don't have any customers and we die in 18 months. I said, okay, do you think Pfizer is going to penalize you for that? Or any of these other companies? Do you still have that experience? Yeah, maybe not. And maybe you're actually worth more when you fail. So he, he was probably the first one to say, you just have to go for it, trust yourself. When we opened our doors, oh, this was amazing. Um, the guy who I started the company with, his name is Mike. Mike, uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a Harvard kid, so don't hold it against him. But he, 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 he brought forward um, an amazing sort of can-do attitude and mechanical sense about him that um, he replicated a, like a Pfizer lab there at uh, 25 Winthrop Street in probably two weeks. And so we did, you know, it's a classic. We, we over three months, uh, bought all kinds of equipment. We were running around all the used, we went to auctions, and the garages are filling up with equipment. And then we got together with Kevin and said, you know, we're moving in April 1st, something like that. Or, um, and then within, well, within a couple of months, we were operational. But we, had, we actually staged it so 
our first, we had jobs already with, with Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and an old company, maybe some of you remember, called Arios up here, the first three customers. And we had jobs lined up with all of them, and they were just waiting for us to get everything built, so we had that sort of incentive. By the end of the summer of 2003, uh, yeah, we were chugging along. Oh, that's a big question. Um, and, and I thought about all of that. Personally, um, yeah, you have to look at the absolute downside first. I am a believer in that. And you know what? It's not always so bad. So what? So these people that invested, they had the money to lose anyway. Right? They wouldn't have invested. Um, if they invested, uh, their kids' college tuition, then that, that, that's on them. All right, so that's usually something you think about, right, in terms of failure. But, you know, we live in a culture now where, you know, people say fail harder. And, um, you know, I would say if you, look, it's always nice to have first customers, we just talked about. Um, and it might help to have a team small team, even if it's just advisors to start out as a support. Um, and uh, I mean, because I think we're talking about just not getting disenfranchised with the effort. You, you have a few early failures and people can give up. Um, but you, you have to keep that mentality of resilience. And um, you know, failure isn't an option. But when it happens, how bad can it be? I mean. You, have, you, you haven't you learned something, even even at the point where you had to reinvent yourself again. So, but uh, but the other the other component there is that's why. Um, so as as a consultant, um, you know, I started this Crow's Nest BioVentures consultancy, and my focus is on uh, is on scientists who, like I said, they, they have a scientific hypothesis but not a real plan. It's amazing how many people don't have a plan. They might have a slide deck, but it's really not a plan. And when you have that plan built, you're assessing weaknesses and strengths and potential pitfalls and even the absolute downside. And then you can work your way up from protecting the downside. Maybe you need more money. Maybe you need to try two or three things instead of one, make different bets. So one, one hits and, and the other two don't. Um, I don't know. It's just. Just different examples, but the plan is critical to the, the first question. I wouldn't have started a company without a business plan because it, it, I trusted it. I trusted the plan, even though it was only 40% correct. <laughs> we had to rewrite it in 18 months. But the, you just had that confidence, you know, when you start. Well, well. Pfizer um, was paying for it. <laughs> uh, these are the glory days, uh, so it's a little bit tougher now. They, 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 Pfizer had a limo in, in, in Cambridge, so they would pick me up in the middle of the day and take me over to BU, and then, and then the driver would pick me up in BU and bring me back to my job, which is actually pretty cool. <laughs> so why not? No. Um, actually, I, I was the, the same guy, one of my mentors at Pfizer, he came down and said, you. You should augment your, you know, a lot of the PhDs here don't have the management skills you have um, and the leadership skills that you have. You should go to school, bring, bring um, you know, some of the, the core things you have in, uh, to, to an MBA and build in around it different concepts. And, um, but, it, but that was just the start, really. Um, there's a lot of, the, the, I take the same advice that we give the employees, continual self-improvement. I'll take some MIT, like technical marketing for um, um, executives, classes, and you meet a lot of different people, you, you hear their war stories, but you also, there are things that day to day in a company that you just can't possibly learn. And when you break out or go to something like that, you really can learn a lot. You know, some of the best case studies in graduate school were about McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts and stuff like that, um, that I just wouldn't have forced myself to do. I'm, I'm not that type of person. I'd say, you know, the one thing that I always talk about is exactly what I just said. It's like, you know, really, 
It's like anything in life. Write it, write it down, make a plan. Um, and then the, the, other, the components of the business plan, um, whether it's a, 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 you know, the old school business plan that could be 20 pages with financials, or it's an Osterwalder canvas. Um, these are really, really critical. Um, and the components of that plan, you, you know, looking out and really aggressively studying the market and giving um, existing incumbents or even your competitors respect. Um, actually, Pete Russo talked about that. He's like, you know, if, it, if you're the only one with the idea, maybe there's a reason. But the odds are there's a hundred other people with the same idea. Um, you know, learn from your competitors. Don't just go forward with this blue ocean strategy and that they're that that it, with the with the part of the blue ocean strategy, which many good things about the blue ocean, um, that they're irrelevant. They're not, they are relevant. You need to study them. And it, it, it is other components like you know SWOT analysis, very important. Um, and look, and it really, I think the marketing piece um, from the MBA was from a class standpoint. Ah, it was awesome. And that's, so I went on to M uh, MIT and a few other places just to take their marketing classes because it's a distinct advantage for scientists who can learn more about marketing um, because the chances are that's going to differentiate in a way that you're really not that different. In a, in a, in a sea of parity, differentiation depends on your marketing. I think we, we had, uh, we were creating a market because we were aggressive with our marketing. So we were creating awareness around the option to outsource um, the, the bundle of activities that Blue Sky did. I can't tell you how many times we heard in the first couple of years, uh, why would we do that? Or um, um, we, we've never heard of anyone who does that, that, that bundle of activities in one house. Um, so we were, we, were, we were very proactive to educate the community on what options they had. So obvious, obvious and fortuitous for us that a lot of the large pharma were grinding themselves into the earth and then you had all, all these other small companies popping up. You know, you know the, the Epizymes and the Momentas and, and the Bluebirds and the others that we all read about today. You know, these are all, you know, a lot of them, ex-pharma. So um, they, they, back even, even 10 years ago, um, would say, oh, we didn't know that existed. We don't have to build that lab. We don't have to spend a million dollars to build a gene to protein lab. We'll just, we'll stay lean. We'll focus on the, the chemistry, maybe downstream or the antibody, and we'll have Blue Sky do that early stuff. You know, we, one of our, um, you know, if was, there were customers on a wall for Blue Sky, one shining example of that is Sertris. So anybody know Sertris? Remember those guys? Sertris Pharmaceuticals? They cloned, expressed, and purified um, 21 members of a Sertuin epigenetic targets. And GSK bought them for $700 million. And Blue Sky did probably 75% of the production of the, those Sertuins that, that they were screening. And they, at a time when epigenetics was, was, was blowing up in terms of popularity, uh, for drug discovery, they got to market really fast because they decided not to build the gene to protein workflow. They became aware of what Blue Sky was up to. We, we, we just hit the ground running for them and made all their targets. They got right into the screen and sold the company in like a record time. It was two and a half years, three years. The guys got it. Give them a big hand. There's no question about it. To answer your question, I suggest that Pfizer made a great investment. When he told me that he was getting his master's and writing a business plan at the same time, I said, boy, that's cool. Pfizer, that was a great investment by Pfizer in the long run. Anyway, just a quick story. Just a, I forgot to tell it. I, Paul, I've told it before, but it, it really exemplifies you. Um, some of you know I'm a runner, and I get out and run the Ugh. roads or whatever. And, you know, I was running with about 5,000 of my closest friends down in Narragansett, Rhode Island on Friday night during the summer. You know, they do this Blessing of the Fleet race. And so I'm running with this guy that runs with me about the same. Running, where are you from? Upstate New York. Where are you from? Worcester. But he said, Worcester. Worcester. He said, yeah. He says, what do you do? I said, well, I'm in the biotech business. I said, biotech. And he says, do you know Blue Sky Biotech? I said, sure, I know Blue Sky Biotech. It just so happened they're in our incubator. 
He says, you're kidding me. So I'm right along and I said, what? How the hell do you know about Blue They just started Blue Sky Biotech. I said, you're from upstate New York. He said, I invested $10,000 in it. I said, what? He said, I invested $10,000 in it. True story. So I'm running along and I, you know, I don't want to get too nosy, but I said, what the hell is a guy from upstate New York, young guy like you, investing $10,000 in a company? You couldn't you didn't even know what they did. Uh, he said, unbelievable. I'm best friends with the founder's cousin. True story. I'm best friends with the founder's cousin. And as soon as he told me that, I said, this guy's a winner. <laughs> to go and, and, and raise the money. How much was it that you raised? Um, uh, over to start off 400000 400000 10000 5000 at a time. And the, his best friend's best friend. I mean, it's just crazy, you know? Anyway, to finish the story, the guy's went along. He, a few minutes, he says, am I going to lose my money? <laughs> and I said, I said, no, you're going to do just fine. And he started, he said, oh, you made my vacation. He was down on his vacation. He said, no, you made my wife's vacation. She said, what are you doing with our money? But anyway, that paid everybody back um, in that balloon payment. And uh, basically, they owned a little piece of company that when you sold it, uh, you had to shake everybody down the hill, had to sell out. But he did very well. But I tell that story not only because, you know, I admire the guy, but it talks about what you need. You know, it, it isn't just found. I mean, he has it. And to go out and raise 400000 you know, a little clip at a time, in a story like that told me that if I'm an entrepreneurial, he's going to be a success.